Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 661, Reconnaissance Tools. During lunch, Lumian used the excuse of going to the washroom to make his way to Hisoka Twanaku's tawny house. After ascending the wooden stairs and passing through the empty, open ground floor, he took out a new wire and picked the lock on the door. This level was completely open air, leaving only support pillars. At a glance, it was very spacious and simple. Stepping onto the wooden floor, Lumian circled around, but found signs that no one had lived here for a long time. He found nothing worth further investigating. Suddenly, a voice came from behind him. What's the problem here? The voice belonged to Camus Castilla. When he saw Lumian enter Twanaku's rebuilt house from the dining room window, he found an excuse to leave the table and hurry over. Lumian wasn't surprised at all. He looked around and said, nothing. As he spoke, he ascended the stairs to the third floor. Camus sighed silently and followed. He felt his mentality had aged considerably when with Louis Berry resembling someone Vice Captain Reese's age. Oh, Mother Earth, I'm not even 24 years old. Although I arrived in Matani at 18 and joined the patrol team, dealing with numerous Bayonder incidents, participating in dangerous battles, and accumulating extensive experience, I am still a young man, a laid-back young man who doesn't focus on appearances in daily life. With a solemn, vigilant mindset, Camus followed Lumian through the third floor rooms twice, searching through all the items. There's nothing out of place. After setting down a pen holder, Camus shared his assessment with Lumian. Lumian hadn't gained anything either. After a moment's contemplation, he responded, Bring Colobo here later and ask if there are any areas that make him uneasy, dangerous, or uncomfortable. Having only collaborated once, he's already adept at utilizing Colobo's uniqueness. Bringing Colobo here, why does it feel like a police officer asking a constable to bring a canine unit? Camus criticized inwardly and nodded. Understood. As Lumian surveyed his surroundings again, he thought, I'll bring Ludwig over later and ask if he detects any fragrance of special ingredients. Returning to the dining room with Camus, Lumian indulged in the Guadar beverage, savoring the rich and intricate aroma of roasted beef, roasted chicken wings, roasted snake meat, roasted spiders, and roasted leeches. After eating and drinking his fill, Lumian took Ludwig's hand and led him to Hisoka Twanaku's house. Camus, Lugano, and Colobo, who wore sunglasses and walked sideways like a crab, followed closely behind. After exploring every nook and cranny, Lumian looked at Ludwig and asked with a smile, Is there anything edible here? Ludwig shook his head. No. Lumian led the boy down to the second level and looked at Colobo, who had suddenly turned his back to them, and Camus. Do any of you sense anything unusual? The thin Colobo hesitated for a moment and said, This house feels a little cold. It doesn't sit well with me. Where exactly? Lumian inquired with a calm expression. Colobo replied succinctly, everywhere. There's something wrong with the entire house and even this land. Hisoka definitely didn't rebuild his previous home for nostalgia. He's not the original owner of that body, so he probably doesn't have much attachment to this place. He's also a true cold-blooded. Lumian pondered for over ten seconds and said to Lugano, Camus, and the others, Stay here and guard against any mishaps. He returned to the third floor and lay on a wooden bed with traces of someone having slept in it. Large, black mosquitoes flew over with crackling sounds. However, in the flickering sparks, they were ignited one by one, turning into charred corpses that floated onto the bed. Lumian quickly slipped into a deep slumber. In his daze, he slowly awoke. Pa! Lumian took out the golden pocket watch from Sal de Balbrissé, opened it, and muttered to himself, slept for half an hour and didn't have any special dreams. He had always believed the dream festival was related to dreams, so he deliberately slept in Hisoka's house, but nothing happened. Lumian gazed at the midday sun shining through the window and stood up thoughtfully. Could the timing be off? Must I sleep at a specific time and place to participate in the dream festival? 
therefore, most Tizimo town residents are unaware of its existence. When Lumian returned to the spacious but crude second level, he realized Camus and the others now had three more people with them. One was a man in his thirties with a painted face. His light brown skin and thick lips gave him a relatively clean-cut look, and his black hair fell to his shoulders. A strong pungent smell wafted from him. The other was a young woman wearing dark leather armor. Her brown hair was tied in two strands draped over her shoulders. Her light brown skin and facial features exuded a wild beauty. She carried a hunting bow and a leather quiver of arrows on her back. Another man, dressed similarly to Camus and the others in a shirt and thin pants, stood over one nine meters tall with an appearance leaning towards the Faisak Empire. He had short light blonde hair, light blue eyes, and a face bearing signs of exposure to sun and rain. There are colleagues, members of the Tizimo Town Patrol team, Camus introduced. He pointed at the man with the white paint pattern on his face and said, Captain of the local patrol team, Meslo? his teammate. Camus turned to the wild-looking woman with a bow and arrows on her back and the tall Faisatian man and said, Re. Loban used to be an adventurer. He spoke in Intision the entire time. Finally, Camus addressed the three local patrol team members, This is the great adventurer Louis Berry. The other two are his assistant and godson. This is the great adventurer Louis Berry. The other two are his assistant and godson. Great adventurer, Maslow repeated the term and cast his gaze at Loban. Faisatian Loban shook his head, indicating he had never heard of him. Maslow averted his gaze and asked Lumian, Are you here to hunt? Tizimo Town had been a favorite hunting ground for Port Pylos's gentry for decades. There was no shortage of residents proficient in intision, and the patrol team had language requirements to handle the gentry's requests. Lumian responded with a smile, something like that. Hunting for Hisoka's inheritance and hidden issues was also a form of hunting. Seeing the skeptical expressions on Maslow and the others' faces, Camus hurriedly explained, Do you remember the telegram sent last night? You mean, with her hunting bow and arrows, Re couldn't help but glance at Lumian again. Clearly, she, Maslow, and company had just arrived and hadn't had time to discuss the detailed situation with Camus and Colobo. A telegram could only convey limited information. Camus nodded solemnly. Monsieur Louis Berry is here to investigate the hidden issues behind Twanaku. Using the excuse of inspecting the house again, he led the three local patrol team members upstairs. Lugano glanced at the stairs and asked Colobo, who had his back to them, there's a local patrol team in Tizimo. Based on his experience, there shouldn't be any official Bayonder teams permanently stationed in the northern continent's small towns and villages like Port Pylos. They would typically send someone to handle issues as they arose. Colobo turned his back to Lumian and Ludwig, trembling as he replied, Most other towns don't have them. This place is rather special and is often attacked by primitive tribes. Not only did our patrol team station a permanent team here, but the Admiral Guard also has Bayonders at the military camp outside town. Lugano glanced at the strange official Bayonder who doubled as their carriage driver and couldn't hide his curiosity. Why do you always have your back to us and wear black sunglasses? Don't you want others to discover something's wrong with your eyes? Colobo fell silent, unsure if he should answer. At that moment, Camus led Maslow and the others back to the second floor. When they looked at Lumian again, Maslow, Re, and Loban's expressions turned much more serious. Lumian smiled and asked casually, Did anything unusual happen with this house? No. Maslow had already recalled the relevant details. With a nod, Lumian replied, Were you transferred to Tizimo after the attack last year? He recalled the dossier had mentioned the three Bayonders stationed here perished in the primitive tribe's attack. Yes, Loban, the former Faisatian adventurer, replied in a rough voice. It's been nearly a year. It's been very peaceful here. No more attacks. According to the records, the tribe in the primitive forest attacked two to three times a year in past years. 
Admiral Quirrell's response of sending more guards and army deterred the primitive tribe from taking the risk. Did they really retreat into the forest depths? Or did the April Fool's prank cause something to change? Lumian sensed something amiss. After conversing for a while, Lumian prepared to take Ludwig and Lugano to check into the motel. Maslow took a few steps forward and retrieved two items from a small leather bag hanging from his waist. There were brown candles and a glass bottle filled with a light yellow liquid. Mosquito repellent candles and tranquil essential oil? I hope you get a good night's sleep, Maslow said in accented intision. Camus chimed in. What he means is that this place is close to the primitive forest, and mosquitoes and poisonous insects are everywhere. Although you're bayonders, it won't be pleasant if you're accidentally bitten. Furthermore, you won't be able to sleep peacefully and will keep waking up. The mosquito repellent candles are made from plants that mosquitoes dislike. Tranquil essential oil comes from certain animals, making those damned buzzing fellows stay away from you. At this point, Camus, Maslow, Ree, and the others suddenly realized there were no mosquitoes on the entire second level. Lumian turned to Ludwig and accepted the candle and oil with a smile. Then, he gently pinched his nose to confirm the pungent smell on Maslow, and the others came from the tranquil essential oil. After Lumian, Ludwig, and Lugano left Twanaku's house, Maslow looked at Kolobo, who had his back to everyone in confusion. He asked in Dutanese, What's wrong? Chapter 662, Those Words Kolobo finally turned around. He took off his sunglasses and spoke in Dutanese with a weary look. My gut tells me I shouldn't look directly at them. I can only take a quick glance at most. Why is that? Re asked curiously, her wildness evident as she carried her hunting bow. Just intuition, Kolobo replied firmly, unsure of the reason but convinced he shouldn't stare. Loban, the Faisatian, wore a pensive expression. What's on your mind? Maslow, his face painted white, turned to him and asked. The three had worked together in Tizimo town for a year and understood each other well. Maslow could tell Loban had thought of something from his look. Observing Camus and the other's gazes, Loban pondered for a moment before saying, While adventuring across the five seas, I came across this saying, Don't look directly at God. Don't look directly at God. Camus's forehead twitched as he whispered the phrase. As a Castia family descendant, albeit from a collateral branch, he had more extensive mystical knowledge than most Bayonders. Could it be that Louis Berry and his godson were actual gods, unable to be gazed upon? No, that couldn't be right. Kolobo avoided looking at Twanaku directly, yet Twanaku was merely a sequence five Bayonder of the prisoner and criminal pathways, not even a demigod. I've heard that before during the Padre's sermons. It's about respecting and worshipping God, right? said Ri, a devout eternal blazing sun believer. No, it's not from the church scriptures. It's recorded in a mystical text, Loban shook his head, rejecting her explanation. Maslow let out a deep chuckle. Surely the great adventurer can't literally be a deity walking among us. Maybe not a true deity, Loban recalled, but the book's notes state it refers to a mythical creature. I'm unsure what exactly that means, but if it contains the word God, it must have at least some level of godhood. Could that adventurer be a demigod? It doesn't seem that way currently, Camus said, gradually forming a new idea. Perhaps the adventurer is simply one of a deity's blessed, carrying a divine item or aura bestowed upon him. So it's true we can't directly look at God, but that God isn't referring to him, only something he possesses. This could explain the situation with Twinaku very well. You mean like the most famous adventurer? Loban the Faisatian realized. Adventurers, treasure hunters, pirates and merchants across the five seas, now knew Jam and Sparrow had been the fool's oracle before becoming an angel. Precisely. Camus nodded. Simultaneously, he inwardly cursed. Dogged, why was I sent to watch over matters involving a deity's blessed? This was undoubtedly perilous. A moment of carelessness could lead to death. Camus hadn't wanted to accept Vice-Captain Risa's order the day before. 
but over the past five years, Riza had saved him from the brink of death three times. He couldn't refuse. Otherwise, with the prestigious Don Prefix and Castia family name, he could have declined his superior's orders. At worst, he could leave the patrol team and seek opportunities elsewhere. After all, he had already digested the Sequence 7 interrogator potion. He had saved enough funds for his subsequent advancement thanks to Louis Berry's two commissions. Even returning to his family, he wouldn't be the type brushed aside. But to repay Riza's kindness, Camus reluctantly agreed to come to Tizimo Town and monitor Louis Berry's every move. Feeling upset, he couldn't help but inwardly curse. As a devout and educated believer in Mother Earth, Camus wouldn't curse with vulgar phrases like son of a, from his view, mothers were great birth and nurturing equally important, just as the earth nurtured all things growth. After discussing the adventurer Louis Berry, Loban the Fasatian turned to Camus and Colobo, saying, When we transferred to Tizimo, we were told we could return after a year, that we wouldn't stay forever. Now, nearly a year has passed, and you're here too. Does that mean we can return to Port Pylos? As a Fasatian, you appear tall, robust, boorish, and unintelligent, but you're actually dishonest. Did you discover that Louis Berry's matter might be a huge problem and want an excuse to slip away early? Camus acutely sensed Loban's hidden thoughts and joked, There's still a week left. Don't even think about returning to Port Pylos early. We're not here for your rotation. At the Briou Motel. This was the favorite accommodation for the gentleman who came to Tizimo Town to hunt. Although it couldn't compare to Hotel Orella, it was at least relatively clean. Lumian's sole reason for choosing this place was the availability of a suite. Otherwise, he would have to rent two adjacent rooms and utilize his hunter's precise grasp of structures to blast through the adjoining wall without affecting the overall load-bearing walls. When departing, he'd get Lugano to replace the stone bricks and repair the opening. The ground floor was equally open, supported by stone pillars. However, the three-story building above bore a distinct intision flare. The beige walls, recessed statuary niches, arched windows, and Venetian curtains made Lumian feel as if he had returned to Trier. When Lugano lit the mosquito-repellent candle and used its slightly pungent smell to chase away the poisonous insects and mosquitoes, it became even more reminiscent. This is very similar to Tririans using sulfur's smell to repel bedbugs. Lumian recalled his initial arrival in Trier. After using sulfur's smell to chase the bedbugs into the neighboring room, playwright Gabriel ignited it and drove them back. After this back and forth, most bedbugs went elsewhere, leaving only a few that the doll messenger eliminated. Lumian sighed silently, recalling Gabriel's death and the deceased tenants of the auberge du Coq Doré. He walked to the window and gazed at the street below. The gentlemen in hunting attire and their servants on unicorns weaved through the dark brown or light brown townspeople, flowing into Briou Motel, jungle restaurants, and other establishments like rivers. Under the noon sun, Tizimo Town was scorchingly humid this season, making it unsuitable for outdoor activities. On the second floor, Lumian focused his attention and observed the passers-by directly below. He attempted to discern any potential issues with Tizimo Town from their fortunes. He was prepared for backlash or corruption. These passers-by's fortunes are normal. Some seem to have romantic encounters looming, some would lose money, and some might encounter a bloody calamity, but nothing too serious. Lumian averted his gaze and said to Lugano, Take Ludwig to rest. I'll take a walk outside. All right. Knowing the trip to Tizimo Town might be dangerous, Lugano had no intention of wandering out unless his boss asked him to prepare food for Ludwig. He had no choice but to go along. Otherwise, he would be the one eaten. Tizimo Town wasn't small with streets spanning out in two directions. Lumian strolled leisurely, hands in pockets, donning a golden straw hat. He no longer wore the straw hat to enhance Louis Berry's persona, but to shield himself from the sunlight. He had intended to do so many times before. This was because an adverse effect of shadow transformation was a greater fear of sunlight than ordinary people. 
Although Lumian could endure relying on his ascetic abilities, this would impact his condition to some extent. Why make things difficult when he could resolve it with a straw hat? Moreover, with the appearance of Louis Berry wearing a golden straw hat, the enemy wouldn't think he was afraid of sunlight. As his gaze casually shifted, Lumian spotted a girl. She was a typical northern continent native, her black hair cascading down her back like a waterfall, a few sparkling bows adorning her head. Her azure-tinged eyes accentuated her sharp, delicate nose. An unmistakable youthful aura radiated between her brows. The girl wore a light, lace-trimmed, pleated white dress, but instead of high heels, she donned a pair of brown leather boots. As she conversed and laughed with companions, she danced, seemingly unconcerned about passers-by's opinions. Lumian glanced at her again. It wasn't because she was beautiful. Although quite lovely, her appearance and bearing couldn't compare to a demoness or truly beautiful humans. Lumian simply sensed her personality differed from Trier's ladies. In Trier, no matter how open-minded respectable middle and upper-class women were in private, they still publicly cared about image and others' opinions a product of their upbringing. This girl exuded an air of freedom. She could laugh loudly or spin around whenever she pleased. This was distinct from an improperly raised lower-class woman's demeanor. This girl's attire, speech, and aura indicated good education and upbringing. Amandina, daughter of Palms Manor's Sir Petit and Monsieur Robert's fiancé, Camus, resembling a specter, materialized from nowhere beside Lumian with the introduction. Palms Manor was a plantation near Tizimo Town, a southern continent girl raised without Trier's upper. Middle-class societal constraints, as Lumian judged this, he thought of his sister Auror. Sometimes, Auror displayed such a side. However, the reasons were clearly different. Where are you headed? Camus inquired. Lumian retracted his gaze and replied with a smile, The Cathedral. Are you coming with me to praise the sun? Chapter 663, Late Night Like many cathedrals in Antis, Tizimos had a golden dome, resembling the sun's reflection on the ground. As Lumian passed through the door, he was dazzled by the walls, arches, gold leaf inlaid in the dome, a mural sprinkled with golden powder and a golden statue. The sunlight streaming through the glass behind the altar made him instinctively raise his hand, wanting to press down his golden straw hat. It was lunchtime, and many simply dressed Tizimo residents sat in various pews, heads bowed in prayer. They didn't mind the cathedral's dazzling, extravagant appearance at all. This was not only because they had always believed in the eternal blazing sun since childhood, but they also had numerous gold mines in the former Balaam Empire. The people had a widespread fondness for gold, a hobby preserved to this day. Lumian shared an affinity for gold, but didn't want to endure the scorching sunlight. Beside him, Camus tried explaining, I'm not monitoring you, nor am I saying I'll follow you everywhere to prevent accidents. I'm assisting you. You're still unfamiliar with Dutonese. You lack sufficient understanding of the situation in Tizimo and the people here. I can introduce you. Lumian seized the opportunity to turn and ask with a smile, Do you know it well? Camus ruffled his disheveled brown hair and replied without embarrassment, if there's anything I don't understand, I can ask Maslow and the others to help. Lumian didn't mind having an official Bayonder by his side. If anything happened, he could use the extra muscle. He nodded slightly and said, If you want to follow, go ahead. As Lumian spoke, he walked towards the row of seats in front of the altar under the blazing sunlight. Camus hesitated for a few seconds before finding a seat in the farthest corner of the cathedral. As a believer of Earth Mother, he could freely enter and exit the cathedrals of all Orthodox gods, but he couldn't participate in acts of worship. He only knew that Louis Berry had a close connection to the Church of the Fool, but he wasn't sure if his faith was with the Fool. Lumian used his ascetic endurance to control the twitching of his facial muscles. He sat down under the sunlight as if nothing happened and lowered his head to pray in front of the preaching padre. The padre, a native of Port Pylos named Kali, had standard dark brown skin, sunken eyes, and a chiseled face. 
he only had a thin layer of black hair, not wearing a clergyman's hat. In his forties, with a solemn expression, he preached in unaccented intision. Lumian, feigning prayer, found himself distracted. Thoughts raced through his mind, making him feel as if he had returned to Cordu. Back then, even when attending Mass and praying in the cathedral, he was lost in his own thoughts. When it was almost over, he quickly praised the son and wished his sister would always be healthy, and that he wouldn't need much homework or test prep to get into university. None of that came true. After the Padre finished preaching, Lumian raised his head and narrowed his eyes in the sunlight, focusing on observing the Padre's fortune. There was nothing special about it. On the surface, there's indeed nothing abnormal about Tizimo. Amidst sunburn-like pain, Lumian planned to avert his gaze, but his heart stirred as he activated his Reaper's weakness investigation ability. He thought of Padre Guillaume Bainet and Father Montserrat of the Church of Earth Mother. Who said clergymen from Orthodox churches wouldn't be problematic? In that case, he could observe the Padre's weaknesses in advance. If he truly encountered clerical depravity in the future, he could quickly resolve it. Various colors appeared on the Padre's body in Lumian's eyes. However, there was no pale white among them. This meant the Padre had no weaknesses. Impossible. Even if this Padre is a Bayonder, his sequence shouldn't be too high. How can he have no weaknesses? The sun pathway isn't known for toughness and imperviousness. Could he be from another pathway? No, all likely have weaknesses. Amidst surprise, Lumian observed more closely. Finally, he noticed a faint pallor. It wasn't on the Padre's body, but in the depths of his astral projection. Does this mean his weakness lies in his spirit, fearing attacks targeting his spirit body? How did he manage to have no bodily weaknesses? From the looks of it, I have to dismantle his body piece by piece to kill him if I'm not targeting his spirit body. Lumian's surprise quickly dissipated, replaced by joy and anticipation. Regardless, discovering any abnormalities was a good thing. This meant he was a step closer to the problem in Tizimo and the dream festival Hisoka had mentioned. Brother, what are you looking at? Kali asked Lumian with a smile, clutching a Bible. Lumian responded with a smile, looking at the sunlight on you. Praise the sun. With that, Lumian stood up, spread his arms slightly, and turned to leave. Now was not the time to delve into the abnormality in the Padre's body. Padre Kali was delighted by Lumian's response. Firstly, the other party was subtly praising him for being bathed in sunlight akin to a deity's blessings. Secondly, as a local clergyman without northern blood, he had always yearned for northern gentry's recognition. After leaving the St. Seen Cathedral, Lumian casually had Camus circle the entirety of Tizimo twice with him, including the military camp, plantation, and the outskirts of the primitive forest. Camus eagerly introduced everyone he knew. As evening approached, Lumian made his way towards the Briou Motel and asked, What did you do with that dead horse? I sold it to the butcher. I'm planning to buy a new one from a nearby planter, Camus replied matter-of-factly. Lumian felt a twinge of disappointment for Ludwig. He remained silent and entered the motel. Late at night. In the shadows outside the Briou Motel, Lumian emerged, no longer wearing his golden straw hat. He strolled towards the yellowish-brown house that Hisoka Twanaku had rebuilt. It was nearly midnight and Tizimo had grown very quiet. Apart from a few patrolling soldiers, drunk patrons, and their companions, no one else was walking outside. Under the crimson moonlight, Lumian passed by the bar named Giant Boa and heard a commotion inside. In the primitive forest a few hundred meters away, the howls of wild beasts echoed intermittently. Lumian proceeded until he reached his destination. He ascended to the third level and found the wooden bed he had slept on earlier. He busied himself for a while, making preparations. He wasn't in a hurry to lie down. He looked around and muttered to himself thoughtfully, Termiboros, have you noticed anything unusual here? Termiboros's majestic voice reverberated within Lumian's body. I'm using your eyes, ears, nose, spirituality, and fate to observe the outside world just slightly more than what you see. 
Does this mean that what I see and discover will still be restricted by my body, spirituality and level? Hold on, this fellow is becoming more and more like a Riddler. He didn't directly answer if there's anything abnormal about this house or what's abnormal. Lumian scoffed. Are you truly an angel of the fate domain? I'm already a sequence 5, and you can't use my eyes and spirituality to detect the problem here. Haven't you noticed that a sequence 8 of the monster pathway can sense that this place is cold? No way. Are angels of the inevitability pathway inferior to sequence 8s of the fate pathway? The monster pathway was also known as the fate pathway. Lumian provoked Termiburos to see if he could extract any useful information from this angel-level ascetic. He didn't hold out much hope, but at least he wouldn't lose anything. Termiburos fell silent, as if he had vanished from Lumian's body. How tolerant, as expected of an ascetic angel, Lumian mocked. He took out the golden pocket watch he had obtained from Sal de Bal Brise and flipped it open to confirm the current time. 11.51 p.m. Putting away his pocket watch, Lumian lay on the wooden bed in the room. This time, he was here to see if sleeping in the house at night would trigger any abnormalities and if he could enter a special dream to participate in the dream festival. To this end, Lumian had instructed Ludwig in advance to wake him up in the house rebuilt by Twanaku if he wasn't back by the time they had their second meal. After Lumian promised there would be a feast the next day, Ludwig agreed. With crackling sounds, the menacing spiders crawling on the outer walls of the house and the numerous mosquitoes in the room burned and fell, emitting a charred fragrance. Relying on cogitation, Lumian swiftly drifted into a deep slumber. In a daze, he slowly woke up. He straightened up and realized that he was still on the wooden bed in the master bedroom on the third floor of Hisoka's house. It was late at night outside the window, and the crimson moonlight seemed to be obscured by clouds. Only a small amount of light filtered through, making it abnormally dim. The howling of wild beasts in the primitive forest and the faint noise from the bar had completely ceased. The night had entered its most peaceful state, as silent as death. There's no change, Lumian sighed in disappointment. Just as he was about to take out his golden pocket watch to confirm the time and leave the house in the dark environment to return to the Briou Motel, his pupils suddenly dilated and his eyes froze. Under the dim crimson moonlight, Lumian swiftly scanned the room's floor. He didn't see mosquito corpses, the mosquitoes he had incinerated with his pyromaniac powers before falling asleep should have been charred on the ground, but now they were nowhere to be found. The floor was clean as if it had just been cleaned. Could it be that someone came in while I was asleep and cleaned the room? I've planted several traps around me. They can't be easily bypassed, Wraith. Lumian instantly tensed up. He took out the golden pocket watch he had previously kept in his shirt pocket under his vest and flipped it open to check the time. 11.58 p.m. Chapter 664. Confirming the Boundary. 11.58. Lumian's gaze fixated on the golden pocket watch, his suspicions heightened by the peculiar scent in the air. He felt as though he had slumbered for more than an hour. Why then had only seven minutes elapsed? Though the unreliability of his instincts were plausible, other anomalies lurked. The absence of mosquito corpses and the eerie silence hinted at peculiarities. Lumian, drawing from his past encounters, murmured to himself, could it be that I've entered a special dream? In the dead of night, slumbering within this tawny house leads to a peculiar dream. Did Hisoka Twanaku rebuild the house to make it look less suspicious for him to stay there? But why would such a thing happen? Lumian bowed his head and peered ahead. His gaze seemed to penetrate through wooden planks and various obstacles, revealing the corresponding underground area. Uncertain about the origin of this anomaly, he could only speculate based on common sense and experience. In the silent darkness, Lumian shuffled his feet, producing creaking sounds as he left the house that once belonged to Hisoka Twanaku. The street lay deserted, and many of the livestock on the ground floor of the buildings seemed to blend into the night. It was impossible to discern if they still existed. The footsteps of patrolling soldiers had vanished completely. 
A warm, humid night breeze swept through the unobstructed streets surrounding Lumion as he headed towards the entrance of the giant boa bar. Straining his ears, Lumion noticed that it was so quiet that even the rustling of insects and the buzzing of mosquitoes had ceased. His expression remained unchanged as he extended his right hand, pushing open the heavy wooden door. Darkness shrouded the interior. With the dim moonlight filtering through the window and Lumion's sharp eyesight as a hunter, he could barely discern the outlines of the bar counter, liquor cabinet, small round table, chairs, candlestick wall lamps, and other items, but not a single human was in sight. The bar seemed to have been closed for quite some time. This is even more perplexing. Before I fell asleep, this bar was quite lively. It's impossible for them to clear out the customers and clean every corner in seven to eight minutes. Based on my experience, even though countryside bars close earlier than those in the city and aren't bustling until two or three in the morning, they usually continue selling alcohol until midnight. Also, they usually ask those who are still drinking to leave after they're done. If they encounter a drunk who refuses to leave, it tends to cause some delay. Lumion, a regular at Cordu's All Tavern, felt confident in making such judgments, drawing from his various experiences in different bars. This conviction only strengthened his belief that he was caught in what seemed to be a very real dream. Suddenly, memories of past events in Cordu flooded Lumion's mind, causing his grip on the heavy wooden door of the giant boa bar to freeze. After a moment of contemplation, he decided to leave and headed back to the Briou Motel. Walking through the dark stairs and a corridor paved with aged planks, Lumion returned to his suite on the second floor at a moderate pace. He pushed open the wooden door to the child's room. The dim crimson moonlight poured into the room, illuminating the sky-blue patterned blanket and bedsheets. But no one was sleeping here. Ludwig had disappeared too. Combined with the strange sights on his way, Lumion strongly suspected that he was alone in this dream. All the townsfolk, livestock, and outsiders had vanished, leaving him in solitude in Tizimo Town. This can't be considered a festival unless it is named the Loneliness Festival. Lumion pondered for a few seconds before leaving the Briou Motel and heading towards the St. Seen Cathedral near the cemetery. In the dim moonlit night, the cathedral's golden dome and various decorations on the outer walls seemed to lose their glow, settling into a deep slumber. Lumion didn't want to waste energy pushing open the front door. He pried open a stained glass window and jumped in. In the night's darkness, the place was silent and empty. The dome above exuded an oppressive and cold aura that was absent during the day. Lumion searched the area, but couldn't find Padre Kali, who had exhibited abnormalities the deputy Padre, or any odd job workers. I'm truly alone. Only those who sleep in Hisoka's house can enter this special dream. Yes, and it has to be late at night. How can the dream festival be held? One can't expect all the relevant people to line up at Hisoka's house to sleep at a specific time, right? Disregarding the question of whether we can squeeze in, how did such a widespread collective act deceive the patrol team and the army outside the town? Moreover, it doesn't seem like everyone has been pulled into the dream. The Tizimans I previously found were completely unaware. And the most crucial question. Since it's a dream, why am I lucid? Lumion contemplated for a moment before reaching out his right hand to touch the wall adorned with the religious mural. It felt cold and solid, a genuine stone. Drawing on his extensive experience in realistic dreams, Lumion pushed aside these questions, opting to begin with the simplest reconnaissance. He aimed to confirm the dimensions of this dream and its boundaries. Activating the black mark on his right shoulder, Lumion connected with the spirit world. He saw every corner of Tizimo Town. Through spirit world traversal, he disappeared and reappeared on the packed earth path, leading from Tizimo Town to Port Pylos. Teleportation is possible, that's true. Since it's a dream, nothing is impossible. As long as I believe it's feasible, I should be able to do it. Following the Cordu incident, Lumion delved into numerous dream-related books and sought counsel from Madame Justice, Madame Susie, Anthony Reed, and other Bayonders in the mind domain, gaining a profound understanding. 
Flowing his pace, he headed towards Port Pylos. After walking for two to three hundred meters, the scenery ahead blurred, as if an ethereal fog was swirling. Beneath the faint moonlight, the fog appeared pitch black. Suddenly, Lumian's spiritual intuition warned him that entering the misty area, veiled in an illusionary fog, might be perilous. There was a high likelihood that something terrifying would occur. There are indeed limitations. I can't directly reach the edge of the mind. Lumian decided against taking the risk. He swiftly returned to Tizimo and began searching for the other boundary. This was the area near the primitive forest. After covering a distance of 300 to 400 meters, Lumian reached the forest's edge. Rainforest-like vegetation stood silently in the night, resembling dense tombstones. Noticing no blurry areas veiled in illusory fog, Lumian proceeded cautiously and decisively. Passing through drooping vines and trees, he delved deeper into the primitive forest, walking on the thick, humus-covered ground. Along the way, there were no dancing mosquitoes or venomous creatures concealed among the vegetation. After another 700 to 800 meters, Lumian sensed his surroundings becoming more psychedelic. Some areas became blurry, others distorted, and some became clearer. However, upon closer inspection, they couldn't be seen distinctly. The conditions in these areas continued to fluctuate. This feels more like a typical dream. With no warning from his spirituality, Lumian took a few more steps forward. Suddenly, the entire world shattered into scenes that interweaved and materialized around him. Lumian's lucidity wavered, leaving him slightly disoriented. In the next moment, he witnessed scenes of black boulders and humans in dark robes. One of the humans raised his head, revealing a pale white face with a light brown base, flaxen-colored eyes tinged with dark green and decent facial features. Hisoka, Hisoka Twanaku. He was Hisoka Twanaku, the human in the dark robe embodying Hisoka Twanaku's visage straightened up. His gaze seemed to transcend various scenes and fixate on Lumian. Amidst the illusory sound, the scenes around Lumian shattered. Lumian sat up and found himself back in the tawny building that Hisoka Twanaku had rebuilt. He was in the dark room with the simple wooden bed. Quickly surveying his surroundings, Lumian retrieved a golden pocket watch from the left breast pocket of his shirt. Clicking it open, he checked the time. 1.38 a.m. The crimson moonlight outside the window wasn't too bright, but it wasn't dim either. The nearby giant boa bar had already closed, yet the howl of a wild beast echoed from the distant primitive forest. The night was silent, but not deathly still. I'm awake? That's more like it. I slept for an hour or more than forty minutes, quite close to my estimation. Lumian got out of bed and observed the ground. As expected, he saw charred mosquito corpses and numerous insects lingering outside the window, blocked by the smell of tranquil essential oil. Phew! He breathed a sigh of relief and contemplated the appearance of Hisoka Twanaku in the special dream. Since it's a festival, dream festival shouldn't be held just once that's what a party is. Could Hisoka have participated in many dream festivals in the past few years and left some kind of mark in the dream? Is dream festival indeed related to that primitive tribe? That's why I activated certain imprints and images recorded in the dream after venturing deep into the forest. That's how I saw Hisoka. What purpose does Hisoka intend to achieve with the dream festival? Dream festival, dream festival. Since it's a festival, it must be held on a fixed date. At other times, if I enter a special dream, I won't encounter anything just like me tonight. What date could it be? Lumian fell into deep thought. He quickly deduced a direction. On December 17th of last year, the primitive tribe attacked Tizimo town, causing numerous casualties. Lumian perked up and swiftly confirmed today's date. Dream festival happens on December 17th or two or three days before it, which is when April Fools played their prank here. Chapter 665 Clues if the dream festival has a fixed date, as I suspect, it should be one of the coming days or span a few days. Recently, I came to Hisoka's house every night to sleep, trying not to miss the dream festival. 
I also need to figure out the basic patterns of the special dream as much as possible before it begins. For example, how to leave the dream normally without entering the primitive forest. Lumian closed the golden pocket watch and slipped it into the breast pocket of his shirt, concealed by his vest. He didn't continue sleeping there. Instead, he chose to descend the stairs and enter the streets of Tizimo. First, Ludwig would have his second supper in 20 minutes. According to their agreement, if Lumian didn't return in time, Ludwig would come over and forcefully wake him up. Second, he had to update Madame Magician on his discoveries. Just as Lumian stepped out of Hisoka's house, a voice suddenly sounded from behind. What exactly are you investigating? In a dark corner where the crimson moonlight couldn't reach, Camus Castia emerged, dressed in a white shirt and an unbuttoned yellow vest. His disheveled hair collapsed from staying up too late. At some point, the young leader of the Port Pilos patrol team's combat team had been waiting here. Lumian wasn't surprised at all, as if he had sensed Camus' presence. He evaded the question and said, Many scenes display different states during the day and at night. Indeed. Camus had dealt with numerous mystical incidents that matched this description. The simplest and most common situation was that certain haunted houses appeared normal under the sunlight. As Lumian walked towards the Briou Motel, he teased Camus with a smile. Have you been awake the entire time, squatting in the shadows outside the motel, observing my movements? That's tough. Careful not to suddenly drop dead. If Camus hadn't known that Louis Berry had a close relationship with the Church of the Fool and didn't mind him tagging along, he would have thought Lumian's teasing was a warning. Do you think I want that? Camus laughed self-deprecatingly. I'll be in charge of watching tonight. It's Maslow or Rhee's turn tomorrow. Lumian didn't engage in further conversation. As if lost in thought, he made his way back to the Brio Motel. Camus wanted to inquire further, but he dared not. He then saw the adventurer stop at the motel's entrance, his back toward Camus. Lumian said calmly, before Twanaku died, he mentioned a term dream festival. I've just discovered some traces in his house and confirmed that there's a special dream happening in Tizimo town. Gather all the folklore related to dreams in this area and bring it to me as soon as possible. Uh, Camus was at a loss at first, but then his mind cleared, as if a bucket of ice-cold water had been poured over him on a scorching summer day. As expected, there's more to the Twanaku incident. There's indeed a huge problem lurking here. Camus wasn't too surprised, but his heart pounded. Instinctively, he replied, Okay. After agreeing, Camus realized that he had unknowingly followed Lumian's instructions as if the other man were the captain of a patrol team. After watching Lumian enter the Briou Motel, Camus briefly analyzed his reaction. He felt that this situation stemmed from both the intimidation brought about by Lumian's strength and the accumulated credibility and reliability of his previous deeds. I have to send a telegram back to Port Pylos to request reinforcements. In addition, I need to familiarize myself with Tizimo as soon as possible and strive to move jurisdiction here within a few days. After considering his next steps, Camus let out another sigh. Ever since encountering Louis Berry, problems had never ceased erupting. I initially came to Tizimo to monitor his actions and prevent any accidents. Why am I now investigating the Dream Festival? Up in the suite on the second floor of the Briou Motel, Lumian greeted Ludwig shuffling to the dining table, having just woken up. He then returned to the master bedroom. Before pondering his letter to Madame Magician, Lumian noticed a folded square of paper on the desk. A reply after midnight so typical of Madame Magician, he thought with an inward chuckle. He picked up the letter and conjured a blazing white fireball above his head for light, as Tizimo lacked gas lighting. Under the fireball's incandescent glow, Lumian unfolded and read the letter. I've completed my astromancy and received a revelation about the rest of the abscessed hand's body. The remaining body is divided into three parts. One part is highly suspected to be located in the underworld, and the other two parts have hints closely related to Lenberg's capital, Ashara, but they're not actually there. 
This reminds me of the City of Exiles Morora, which seals Zuzan 1. It has a similar situation inside Lenberg, yet not truly being in Lenberg. My interpretation is that the two missing body parts of the abscessed hand are hidden away in the City of Exiles Morora. Don't you find it too coincidental? No, it's not a coincidence at all. My astromancy results show that nearly three months ago, one of the two body parts was still located in the tombs of the Paz Kingdom in the southern continent, and the other part was related to some folklore in the south-central region. Get my drift? WH almost three months ago. As a conspirer, Lumian grasped Madame Magician's implication. Accepting the information about the most terrifying sealed artifact Zuzan 1 and masquerading as Ludwig's godfather was akin to accepting an olive branch offered from the Church of Knowledge. Lumian had promised to pay a certain price for this knowledge. It seemed the Church of Knowledge then dispatched high-ranking individuals to gather the two remaining body parts of the abscessed hand and hide them away in the city of exiles, Morora. What does this mean? It is clearly forcing me to journey to Morora, unless I choose to abandon my hopes of advancing to Sequence 4 and achieving the state of demigodhood. Terha, my agreement with the abscessed hand stated that until I found its full body, I would never be able to obtain true godhood. This blocks any idea of trying to become a demigod without consuming potions by relying on boons instead. Thankfully, Lumian wasn't resistant to the idea of visiting the city of exiles Morora before becoming a demigod. At that moment, he didn't feel stifled or vexed by this necessity. Instead, he felt it would actually save him a lot of trouble. After some thought, he continued reading the rest of the letter. My astromancy results also tell me that once the abscessed hand's full body is gathered and reunited, something extremely dangerous will happen. It's best to complete this reunion step while you're in the City of Exiles and use the existence of Zeros and One to try to counteract this incoming risk. In other words, you need to find and retrieve the body part located in the Underworld first. Yes, you should have an opportunity to enter the Underworld itself within the next three months. Remember to seize this opportunity when it arises. Don't ask me what opportunity it is exactly, I don't know the specifics either. Opportunity to enter the Underworld within the next three months. Lumian repeated this crucial piece of information to himself. Amidst his elation, the words struck Lumian as peculiar. Entering the underworld and going to hell were two distinct phrases that conveyed the same meaning. In this world, barring a small number of individuals, no one could readily accept the phrase, you have a chance to go to hell within three months. It was worth noting that many people would curse at each other, saying, I wish you a swift descent into hell. For the moment, Lumian didn't have time to ponder the opportunity to enter the underworld. He burned Madame Magician's reply and jotted down his gains for the night and his guesses about the Dream Festival. He planned to send it to the Major Arcana cardholder at noon the following day. Although he couldn't shake the feeling that Madame Magician's schedule bore a resemblance to Franca's, he wasn't sure if it was convenient to send a letter at that time. Northern Continent Trier Winter sunlight poured through the glass, filling the living room with warmth that chased away the chill. Franca lounged in the recliner, basking in the cozy glow with half-lidded eyes. Suddenly, she sensed something and sat upright, pulling her legs in. In the shadowy corner, a human skull made of pure glowing silver emerged. Pale white flames flickered in its vacant sockets. Madame Hella's messenger, why is she contacting me? Franca watched, puzzled, as the skull's jaws unhinged, releasing a single page that drifted towards her. She snatched the letter and scanned it quickly. A seven hasn't heard from you in four days. He wants to confirm you're okay. Four days without checking the group, a dry chuckle escaped her lips. What does this mean? Early to bed and late to rise keeps the king fit to rule his realm. No more morning courts. In the early morning hours, Franca manned the radio transceiver while Jenna roamed outside, seizing her opportunity to act as a witch. Tap, tap, tap. Her first telegram in days. Sure, Emma, your emperor has returned. Before long, Zo7's telegram was tapped out by the analyzer. 
powered mechanical typewriter. Hidden Blade, where have you been? Ahem. Franca cleared her throat. Late nights breed ill health. Have you no loved ones? Don't bring up such sad topics. Hidden Blade, have you mastered the assassination arts? Sundering heart and soul? Protests arose from the other members. At length, Zoseven's message arrived. I have the intel on the last incident. Let's meet to discuss. The higher-ups also approved the item swap for the story you proposed. Franca blinked, startled. How long did that take? I'd forgotten all about it. After all, understanding that humanoid sealed artifact's tail was Lumian's curiosity, not hers. Von Seven's resigned telegram. Bureaucracy inertia. Unavoidable for any large, established organization. Tell me about it, another member, Moon King's amused agreement clattered out. Whether public or secret, they're all bound by red tape. After arranging to meet with Seven that night with the Morin Avigny intel and initial assassination plan, Franker rose with a stretch. She jotted down the two tasks before performing a ritual to summon Lumian's messenger, Penitent Baneful. Southern Continent, Tizimo Town. Lumian was just about to head to Hisoka's house for a nap when his messenger materialized from the shadows, delivering a letter. After taking the note, Lumian noticed Penitent Baneful didn't immediately depart back to the spirit world as usual. Instead, he lingered, surveying their surroundings with a measured gaze.